Scott and I, once a month, we have the privilege of going uh, to a, a memory care facility uh, where my mother-in-law is a resident, and Scott plays. Uh, it's incredible. It's always, uh, always great. Um, and I'm, I'm throwing him out like, hey, Scott, can we do this one? He's like, oh, sure, Jeff. I'll try to figure that one out on the fly. But, you know, we're with people that have memory issues, but it's amazing what the power of song does, right? And when we sing Amazing Grace, people know that song. And it's just a reality. And I, I hope you know it just more than just a song that you can just kind of sing, but a reality in your heart of God's amazing grace for us. If you have a Bible, uh, we're going to be today in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's uh, in the New Testament. It's a letter that Paul wrote to a church in Corinth. And if you don't have a Bible, uh, we have one for you and right in front of you in the pew. Uh, you could follow along there. I'll also have the words on the screen. We'd love to get give you a Bible. If you don't have one, go ahead and take that home with you. It was awesome. I found out that uh, someone worshiped with us for the first time last Sunday, and they made a comment. They said, you know, we like a church that preaches from the Bible. And so if you're a guest of ours or kind of new to us, this, this is what you're going to get every week. Uh, I'm going to tell you about Jesus every week and incredibly what he's done for us. I'm not, I don't want to tell you my opinion. I don't want to tell you my politics. All I want to tell you about is God's word. Uh, and so we're going to dig in, sometimes Old Testament, sometimes New, sometimes we'll be in the prophets. Uh, but it's an incredible story, and I hope you read it. And if maybe this should be the year that you can read it through, come and join me. It'll be phenomenal. So uh, we're going to dig in again this morning. All right, well, Happy New Year. Where were you last week? Uh, can you believe that we started the year uh, having to say we're just going to stream our service? Uh, we had nobody up here to lead us in worship. We had some, uh, some COVID issues and other things. So happy new year. I don't know about you, but it kind of feels like we're limping into the new year, right? I mean, it's like everybody wanted in 2022 to be a lot different and a lot better. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, it feels like it's been, right? So we're a little bit limping in there. I mean, COVID has been a big part of the story in our, our country, our culture, our church, our world. It continues to be that, but our God is greater. But as we begin a new year, here's, here's the reality. As we begin a new year, uh, we really begin a new and exciting chapter for King's Chapel. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but we really are going to have like a seismic shift beginning today, beginning uh, this month. And so let me tell you a little bit about it. King's Chapel, we're a fairly new church. We are really only two and a half years in existence. Um, when we planted a church in 2019, we never heard a thing called COVID-19. Uh, you know, it hadn't uh, been a part of our life. So imagine starting a church and, and you realize in the midst of all of that, of uh, some of the struggles and the things that we've had to deal with. But God has been so faithful. Well, this, this month, really, our, our, our church is, is entering into an exciting new phase in our church history. I've called King's Chapel a church plant, that we have been a church plant, and I would tell you that I believe that we are becoming what, what many will say a particularized church. Well, let me tell you what that means. We are now electing officers and leaders. We're adding staff members. You're going to hear about that. We're growing, and healthy things grow. I love it. But as we started, we started off as a church that was led by a board of godly men. Uh, now we're, we're moving from that board to a biblical model. And although uh, we, we believed we were biblical, we just didn't have officers trained and ready to go. So we're going to become an elder-led church. And if you read through Scripture in the New Testament, that's what they had. Uh, every town that Paul started a new church, he's like, i got to raise up leaders. we got to raise up those who will, who will lead the church. And so we're going to follow a biblical pattern uh, for us to flourish uh, we really long to flourish, and uh, it's going to be important for the glory of our great God and for the good of our neighbor. We're at this critical junction in King's Chapel history. And so we're going to spend the entire month uh, looking at into God's Word to say, hey, what does it say about the church? And again, who is the church or what is the church? You heard me kind of tip my hand a little bit with the young people that most people think the church is a building, uh, not true. The church is the building. In the New Testament, the church comes from a Greek word, ekklesia. Uh, and that is a compound word. It means those who were called out. Isn't that interesting? The church, you've been called out. And you may want to say, well, what am I called out of? 
Well, according to Scripture, the church are those people by God's grace who have been called out of darkness and into God's marvelous light, who have been called out of by nature children of wrath and, and rebellion against God and been called into a relationship with God as his beloved children. So we are the church. What are we? We're those who have been called out. Uh, we've been called out of the world for a specific love and relationship with God. And so when the Bible talks about the church, it's talking about the people, the people of God. And the Bible gives us some different names of the church, some absolutely beautiful names. When we were in the book of Timothy, it talks about that we are the household of the living God. How cool is that? The place where God dwells among us. And then we see some beautiful descriptions of the church. We're called the bride of Christ. And I love the reality when I can officiate a wedding and when the doors open and there stands the bride. I've never officiated, I've officiated many, a wedding where I don't get teary. Uh, the last one I got really teary because Hetty became Mrs. Jakes. Uh, she was sitting right there. Don't know where she went, Hetty. But anyway, uh, to see the beauty uh, of one who, who radiates the beauty of, of who Christ is, that God calls us his bride. Now let me hit pause. What does the world think of the church? And how has the church behaved? I mean, we're a bunch of scandalous folks, are we not? I mean, we've made a mess of the whole deal, have we not? Let's be honest. And some of our leaders, they've been the woe, the worst. But this is who God sees us in Christ. I mean, clothed in his righteousness and washed in his blood. He's like, whoa, that's my beautiful bride. For all of you who've had the privilege of looking down an aisle and seeing your beloved and saying, wow, she's going to become mine. That's the way that Christ sees us. We are the bride of Christ. But he also says this, we're the body of Christ. That he is the head, but we're connected to him. And we're connected to him to a true and living way. As he lives, we live. And he gives us his sustenance, this connection with him, this union with him, not only gives us our identity and our joy and our security, it gives us our actual life. That he is the head and we are the body. And we are the glorious body of Christ. That is who the church is. And so the, the, the theme for the next four weeks is the glorious body of Christ. That's you and me in Christ Jesus. Uh, so we are going to uh, be looking at the church. And we're going to start by looking at what the Apostle Paul was dealing with the church of Corinth. And the church of Corinth was in many ways a really great church. They had a lot of gifts and abilities like King's Chapel. Uh, Corinth was an area not far from Athens. But not only were they were a great church, they were a mess. And you often think, oh man, in the, old, in the New Testament, all those churches, they had it all together. No, they didn't. They were like us. They were a mess. They were a beautiful mess, just like us. And there's so much to learn. And so we're going to turn to the letter that Paul wrote to Corinth. By the way, I had a chance to be there. It's a really cool port town. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go uh, and experience the living color of some of the Bible places, it's phenomenal. It's great uh, to know, wow, uh, this uh, this has actually happened in a place like this. But it was a messy church. Um, and that's the true of all churches. And it, what, it, what a privilege has been there. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12. And I got four things I want to show you today in 1 Corinthians 12. The first thing is this. We are all a part of the glorious body of Christ. If you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a part. Uh, you may feel distant. You may feel remote. You may feel plugged in. You may not. But according to Scripture, if you're His, you are a part of the glorious body of Christ. Not only that, if you're His, the second thing, we all have been given spiritual gifts. Now, we all have certain tendencies. We all have certain natural gifts. But Christians have been given uniquely some spiritual gifts. And then, thirdly, I love this, all individual parts of the body are indispensable. Uh, there's some of you who may feel like, hey, if I don't show up, if I don't come, it doesn't really matter. I don't know if anybody really notices. Do I need to be a part of this church or a church? Uh, you know, what can I contribute? I, I, I don't speak well or I can't teach or how do I help? But let me tell you what scripture says, individual parts of the body are indispensable, all of them. And then the last thing, there should be no division in the body. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, we're going to read uh, all 31 verses, so it's going to be a little bit lengthy. Uh, and I know that when someone reads, especially a longer passage, it's easy to start thinking, oh, like, what do I got to do after church? And who's playing today? And what's going on? Let me encourage you. This is God's word. 
Um, it's never going to lead us astray. So will you lean in? Uh, the words will be on the screen that hopefully help you along as well. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, or this is what basically means unbelievers, you were led astray to mute idols. However, you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now here we get in the meat of this. Verse 4. Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of services, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who appoints to each one individually as he wills. Verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews and Greeks, slaves or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear could say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing? Where, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, they are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty with which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, given greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still a more excellent way. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh, Father God, thank you that you call us the glorious body of Christ, the bride of Christ, your beloved. And God, thank you for loving those who are so broken and so sinful, those who are so prone to wander the way that you do and the way that you will. God, we thank you for who we are in Christ Jesus. Although there are many members that we are one body, and we are to be one in Christ Jesus. And God, we are to reflect the beauty and the reality of the head of the church, Christ Jesus. Oh, how we need your spirit. Oh, how we need your word. Oh, how we need your grace and mercy. God, would you come and would you be teacher? Would you teach us about your church? Would you teach each one of us about the gifts you've given to us? May we see our place where we belong in the church of, 
of Christ, such a, something so much bigger than just King's Chapel, where we fit in the picture. But through all of that, may we know that we are beloved and that we are yours. Oh God, give us ears to hear your voice and minds that understand your will, that hearts that would embrace your truth. And God, give us feet that walk in a manner worthy of your name. God, the things that I say that are wrong are merely my opinion. May those things quickly be forgotten and just fall away. But God, the things that are true, that contain the good news of the gospel, make us more like Jesus, your Son, our Savior, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right. What makes a church flourish? What we need to be, to, to really be all that we should be? Well, it tells us so much in his word. And you know the 80-20 rule? What's the 80-20 rule? Most organizations, 80% uh, of the work is done by who? 20% of the people, right? Uh, oftentimes in the church, we say it's a 90-10 rule. <laughs> it feels like 90% of the work gets done by 10% of the people. Um, a church plant like this, we had a couple people not show up today. They couldn't make it to help set up. You know, I'm driving in thinking, oh, man, are we going to have signs up? Are we going to have anything going on? I mean, it's a scramble at times. Uh, but for really, for the church to flourish, according to God's word, it should be the 100-100 rule. If you're his, you've been gifted. If you're his, you've been called. If you're his, he wants to use you to bless his bride. That every one of us has a role to play. That we can't flourish uh, unless we are all plugged in. And the first thing you got to see this is this, is that we are all part of the glorious body of Christ. Um, now, here's the scary thing. A person can be a part of the local church and not be a part of the glorious true church. You hear what I just said? The interesting thing is there's many church members. There's many people today that says, oh, I'm a part of that church, or I'm a part of this church, or I was baptized into this church, or I was baptized into that church, or my parents belong to that church, and so that I do too. And there's a connection that many of us feel to an earthly church. And in many ways, that's good. But the scary thing is this. Church membership in a local church doesn't mean that you're truly a part of the true church. Because remember, the true church are those who have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's not just those who were baptized in a particular church, who grew up in a, traditional, or, or, or a particular tradition. So the question begins with that, that we are all part of the glorious body of Christ. But the question is, are you a part of that glorious body of Christ? Are you a part of the church? Well, here's how you know. Is Jesus your Lord? And the first three verses are kind of awkward. And again, we're jumping middle into the story in the book of Corinth. But it's basically going to say, listen, you cannot say Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. So if you're able to say by God's grace, Jesus is who he says he is. He's not some lunatic who just claimed to be God. And he's not some liar who told us he was God. He truly is Lord. If, if God has given you the grace, if God has given you the insight that you believe that God's son is God's son, and you believe what he has said, that he is the only savior of sinners. And when you say that Jesus is Lord, you're making a big statement. Now, a lot of people nod their heads, yeah, yeah, Jesus is Lord. But I mean, he's your Lord. He's your king. He's your ruler. You've come to the place in your life, you said, you know what? I need a savior. I'm, my hope is in him. My hope rests on nothing more, nothing less, and nothing other than Jesus' blood of righteousness. And he is my Lord. Scripture says it this way in Romans 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, watch this, you shall be saved. Now that's a big thing. If you confess your mouth that Jesus is Lord, this is more than just church membership. This is more than just a, 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 a sacrament like baptism. This is you saying... Jesus is who we claim to be. God's son, my Lord. And I, and I believe in the miracle of a resurrection. He died for my sins and he, he was resurrected. I believe in that. And if that's the reality, then you're part of the church. You will be saved. Uh, that Jesus is Lord. Now, if you are able to say Jesus is Lord and part of the church, you have the Holy Spirit. Now, but why? Because it says in that first three verses, you cannot say that Jesus is Lord apart from him. Scripture tells us that by nature, when we're born, we got a bad condition called sin. And it doesn't affect just a little bit of us. It affected everything about us. As a matter of fact, Scripture says the truth is, by nature, we're children of wrath. 
by nature, we have actually spiritually, we're dead. We are dead in our trespasses in life. That the only way for us to, to have life, and the only way for us to become uh, a part of the church, or more importantly, become a part of his family, is for us to be reborn. For us to be made new. I mean, to us to be new creations. So, so that's what the Bible says, that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. And that's why Jesus would tell Nicodemus, when Nicodemus, this religious rabbi, showed up at night because he was afraid to be seen with Jesus, and he said, hey, Jesus, what must I do to get in? And Jesus says, you want to get in? You've got to be born again. He's like, what are you talking about? How do you be, you've got to be born not just with, with water. You've got to naturally you've got to be born of the Spirit. The Spirit. And so, for those of us, by God's grace, who call Jesus Lord, it didn't come because of church membership. It didn't come because of a sacrament. It became because of God's grace that he gave us the faith that we could cry out, he is Lord. And if you are here and you love him, uh, you are here and he is yours, and no matter if that's the first day today or you've been doing it a long time, and listen, I know you're prone to wander and stumble just like me, but if he is your Lord, you have the Holy Spirit. You can't have it without him. Okay, so uh, we are all part of the glorious body of tr Christ if Jesus is our Lord and if we have the Holy Spirit and those things go hand in hand. Not only that, we all have spiritual gifts. The Bible tells us that if we are those born-again Christians, that we have the Holy Spirit. That's how we know we are born again. God has given us not only his Son, how amazing, he's given us his Spirit. Uh, and we, with that spirit, have been given spiritual gifts. Now, the reality is for Christians and non-Christians, we're all made in his image. And for Christians and non-Christians, we all have great worth because we reflect the image of our great God. And we hold life as precious in the womb, out of the womb, with dementia, without dementia, no matter who you are, because we reflect who God is, right? And with God created us he graciously gave us some gifts and abilities i'm amazed at some of your gifts i mean don't ask me to assemble something i'm terrible at it don't ask me to read directions i don't know how i mean i mean sir there's things i could do look at my hands my family makes fun of me they said the only hands that you have are mickey mouse hands hi y'all my fingers are fat as can be and they're all the same size right i mean give me something a little bit mechanical to do and i'm a, i'm a nightmare but give me a chance to talk and i love it right and so um, but we've all been given different gifts and abilities, no matter if you're a Christian or not. But watch this. The Christians, if you have the Holy Spirit, you have a spiritual gift. He's given you spiritual gifts. Now, listen, I could spend the rest of the month and a long time talking about what are some spiritual gifts. It, it talked about some gifts of faith, gifts, gifts of uh, a teaching, gifts of knowledge, gifts of administration. There are, there are spiritual gifts. And if you're a Christian, you should know your spiritual gifts. And there are ways to find them out. Today is not the day. I'm going to talk on a bigger picture saying you all have spiritual gifts. I'm not boring down deeply to say this is your spiritual gift today. My point is you are. you got to know them. you got them. Um, we'll have another time to study it. We're looking at the big picture. But it's God who's so, if you're a Christian, you have spiritual gifts. And the second thing we got to see is this. God is the one who has given us our spiritual gifts as he wills. I love that. As he wills. So when you look in the mirror and you want to say, dang it, God, how come I'm not like Julie Rohutsky? I want to be more like Julie Rohutsky. She knows how to make ledger sheets, and she does all those things. Make me more like Julie Rohutsky. God made Julie like Julie, Jeff like Jeff, Ed like Ed, Matt like Matt. He made you like you. He's given you your spiritual gifts. Watch this. As he wills. He's given you what you have. Watch this. He's not giving you what he doesn't want you to have. So get over it and quit complaining. You got gifts, and they're from God's hand, and they're good. And he knows what he is doing. He has given us gifts as he wills to meet his desire for the glory of our great God and for the good of our neighbor. It's not even about us. Isn't that amazing? God's going to say, I love you. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to give you my son and spirit. I'm going to give you gifts. And by the way, they're for me. By the way, and they're for your neighbor. And they're not just for you. I, oh, you, you'll feel my pleasure when you use them. It's great. But no, it's not so that you get built up. It's not so that you get praised. It's not so that you have a bigger platform. It's so that more people know Jesus. That's the whole point. 
So God not only has given us those gifts and he's given us the ones he wants, God has arranged our spiritual gifts as he has chosen. He arranges the body. I love it. I'm going to put together King's Chapel. I'm going to give you a Bill Chapman who's going to show up every Sunday morning really early and set up signs and, and do whatever is necessary. I'm going to give you gifts of people who are going to pray like Robbie Robinson. He's going to be praying like crazy for the church and everything you have. And I'm going to give you gifts of those who give generously financially. And I'm going to give you some teachers. And I'm going to give you some leaders and some elders. I'm going to give you deacons to help you serve together. I'm going to give you some godly men and women. I'm going to give you different pieces. Those who can lead in worship and those who can mix sound. I'm going to give you all these things that are going to come together um, the way I have chosen. But God has given us our spiritual gift. Watch this. I always says for the common good. For the common good. For the big picture. He knows what he's doing, and he's gifted you for his glory and for the common good. God, God has given us that. It's not ultimately about us. It's ultimately about God's glory and the good of our neighbor. But here's what I really love, too. All body parts are indispensable. I love this. I love this. Because I know that many people in the church feel like wallflowers. Many people in the church feel like, I, I never lead a Sunday school class no one's asking me to sing a note. I can't carry a tune in a bucket. You know, where, where do I fit? Where, do, where, where, where are my gifts? But those gifts, that, those body parts that seem uh, weaker, they're indispensable for the church to flourish. Watch this. For King's Chapel to flourish. If you're a part of this church, we need you. We really do. I mean, there's a place for you. Uh, there's a place for you to serve and use your gifts. Um, and it's got to be all hands on deck. It's all hands on deck. You know, I remember years ago, I was meeting with some church elders that I was a pastor of, and I was talking about how do we view our church, and we were using nautical terms. And I, I, I took the, uh, the uh, old game, remember Battleship? All right, somebody, think of how old that was, right? Battleship. And I remember taking the pieces out of the Battleship and saying uh, to the elders, what, what do you think we should be? Should we be a destroyer that goes into community and lobs bombs and telling people how horrible they are? Uh, should we be a tugboat just pushing people along? Um, you know, should we be a submarine that no one really sees and stays under the surface and all of a sudden strikes out of nowhere? Or should we be an aircraft carrier that is like sending missions out in the world? We're like, we, we, we need to be an aircraft carrier, you know? It's just growing. It was, I got into this aircraft carrier. I literally got an aircraft carrier in my office. I, I never was in the Navy. I don't know anything about them. I, I'd be scared on an aircraft carrier. But I think this is who we got to be. But you know what most people think the church is? Carnival cruise lines. Most people think the church is carnival cruise lines. That we're here and we should be at the front door saying, how can I help you today? Let me, let me make sure that every, is, is the temperature okay in here? Did you find everything okay? Are, are you comfortable? We're, we're sorry about our community. It's going to taste like dirt today. But, you know, uh, we're going to do everything we can. Uh, because we are here on the cruise ship King's Chapel. And we want to make your experience as delightful as absolutely possible. Now, hit pause. I want it to be as delightful as possible. But we're not supposed to be a cruise ship. It's not who we are. It's all hands on deck. We, we, we got a mission. We got to tell the world about Jesus. I mean, this is our time. This is, this is where he's placed us. What are we going to do? Are we going to try to say, complain because it's not comfortable enough? Are you going to try to say, well, somebody else should be doing it? No, this is all hands on deck. Let's go. We need you. God has gifted you. Um, and I love what he's doing. And so you say, oh, it doesn't matter to me. I don't need to be a part of the bride of Christ. I mean, I, Jesus and me are fine. I mean, let me just have this solo flight. Read scripture. It's not a solo flight. All the promises that he gives to us are in the plural. He's about his bride. And it just drives me crazy that, that, the, that the world thinks so low of the church. Don't think low of the church because Jesus does not think lowly of the church. It's his bride. And when you're talking about his bride, he's going to defend her. And he says, I'm going to build her, and the gates of hell aren't going to prevail against her. Now, the church is a mess in and of itself. I get it. And King's Chapel is a very small speck in the Christendom of churches. But I've been telling you, each one of you should be in a church. And not just in a church. You should be a member of a church. And not just a member of a church. You should be serving in the church. And not just some of you, but all of you. And if this isn't your place, find one that is. 
And find them that you can serve and flourish. Because the church needs to flourish ever more than now. We need to flourish. Quit thinking we are a cruise line. We're not. We're an aircraft carrier. And we need all hands on deck. Because we got a mission that the world needs to hear. And every part is indispensable. We need you. We need you like never before in a world that's so dark. So it's God. The, 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 uh, the, those that seem to be weaker and indispensable, those that seem less honorable have greater honor. I love this upside-down nature of the gospel. You know, it's not all about the flashy preachers. It's not all about the amazing uh, worship guys. We like those, though, don't we? It's, it's about the whole church, every piece of us. And God has composed the body the way he wants it to be. Everyone needs to be involved. Everyone needs to be helping. And there should be, lastly, no division in the body. I love that he made painstakingly detailed. There are many members, one body. There are many parts, one. One Lord, one body, one truth, oneness, one, one, one. I think of a, a great song of U2, uh, one. Listen to it. Um, I think Bono gets it. But in, in the midst of many, there is one. We, we should have the same care for one another. Uh, we should not only care for one, but I love this. When one member suffers, we all suffer. When one member is honored, we all rejoice. That's what I love about our prayer time at King's Chapel. Because we raise our hand and say, hey, pray. Because I have a family member who's hurting. Pray. Because I got this going on. You know what? And here, here's the reality of where we are right now. We are going to both suffer and rejoice until we make it home. Where we are right now in the story. If you want to hear more about the story, I preached on that last week. Uh, two weeks ago. We live in the midst of the uh, two appearings of great God. We're in that in-between. Every week we show up, there are going to be those who are rejoicing and those who are suffering. And every week we should be rejoicing with those who rejoice and suffering with those who suffer. Every week, those around you, that's what's happening. Well, there should be no division. We should be one. And Jesus has given us a meal that reminds us uh, that we are his. He's given us a meal that's just for his family. He says, don't take this meal if you're not mine. If you don't say that Jesus is Lord, don't do this. Because this is a meal for mine, those who by God's grace are mine. Uh, scripture says to do this in an unworthy manner is dangerous. It's unhealthy. But what this meal does from one bread and from one cup, we celebrate our oneness in Christ Jesus. What this meal does, it's a tangible reminder of what it took for us to be his. God's son, broken. So through his brokenness, we could be healed. We're gonna, I'm going to pray for us. Uh, we're going to then prepare our hearts by saying the, saying the Apostles' Creed together, uniting our hearts of what is it we believe. Scott's going to lead us in a song, and then we'll have our communion. Lily is in the back, and if you are here and you did not get one of our uh, communion package cups, bread and juice, um, I know we need one up front. You can have that as well. But hold on, let me, let me pray for us. Father God, what a joy it is to be a part of the glorious body of Christ. I did nothing to deserve it. And God, you have chosen and ch chosen us in Christ Jesus because you love us. And there's a mystery to that. But God, you have gifted each one of us who say Jesus is Lord with spiritual gifts. And God, we're not supposed to be a cruise liner just taking care of the needs of the body. But we are on mission for Christ our King. And God, every hand needs to be on deck. Remind us of that reality. Feed us now spiritually uh, through this meal. Uh, God, grow us through this meal. May we be reminded of the oneness, that we are one family in Christ, one body. And remind us that you are here to empower us to go into the world to tell them good news. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.